So I'm going to get started. I'm actually speaking on behalf of Vicki Evans. Vicki was our Australian colleague, and she had a bit of a family emergency and needed to return home. So I'm giving uh, Vicki's introduction to high altitude sickness, and, and then Abby will come up and speak about her personal experience. Um, so we will start now, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of the mountains that we see and all the, the heights of what we see. So we know that, for example, that we have one way down there in Australia, which Vicky put up there, which is 2,200 meters or so, but they go as high as Everest, which is 8,800 meters. And we do know that in, when we look at patients with altitude problems, that oftentimes, irrespective of how fit you are, you, don't, you, you cannot recognize if you're gonna run into altitude sickness until you're actually at that altitude. Okay, and that's one thing I think that's a bit of a misnomer is that people assume that, you would assume being climbing Everest that you would have to be very fit, but oftentimes even the fittest of people can get altitude sickness, and some who aren't that fit actually don't develop altitude sickness. Can you so, just translate that to feet per second for Everest? Ah, uh, so it's, three, it's 39 inches per meter, so it's 3.3 feet, so it's about 28,000 feet. Okay. Sorry, we work in meters, and um, so sorry about that. Okay. Um, so Vicky was actually very kind to actually set, put her son there, who actually has climbed to the 2,200 meters, which is about 7,000 feet. Okay. So what do we know about high about altitude? So we do know that irrespective of how high you go, the oxygen concentration, which is around 21%, actually is no different than what it is at sea level. And I think that people assume that the air is thinner the higher you go, which is correct, but it's not thinner because there's less oxygen, it's thinner because the oxygen is more diffuse. And so even though it's available, it's actually not available to us because the air is actually much thinner at the top. Okay, And at, the, at, at, at 20, 12,000 feet, which is around 3,600 meters, there's 40% less oxygen than there is at sea level. And at 18,000 feet, there's 50, 50% less oxygen. So I had an opportunity, which Abby will speak about, but I got to 17,000 feet. And uh, we had a portable O2 sat monitor, and my sat was 70%. And I didn't have any altitude sickness, yet there was a woman beside me who was vomiting and vomiting and vomiting, and they had to take her off. And I was just asked to do the climb at the end of the, hey, we have a spot, you want to do the climb? I said, sure, it sounds like a good idea. Uh, and, and so everyone's, and she clearly was much more fitter than I was, and yet she developed altitude sickness very quickly, and we had to take her down, and I was sitting at the top having my breakfast kind of thing. So it varies according to, but what we do know is that even though the, it is the same, the oxygen concentration is much less. So what happens is, so as O2 pressure begins to decrease, we know, we recognize, which makes complete sense, that you're breathing, your heart rate increase. And as, and as does the heart's contractibility and the force of the contraction. And we do know, if you think about people that train at high altitude, or athletes that train high altitude, they actually get to develop a bit of polycythemia because the RBCs get bigger in size, as does the production of the RBCs to carry the, all the possible oxygen that's available. We do know that the higher you go, the more you have to pee, and the more you sweat. And when you do that, it leads into dehydration. So you imagine these poor climbers at 30,000 feet having to go to the bathroom, and they've got all this stuff on. Uh, and, and the polycythemia and dehydration increases the risk of pushing pudding through your veins. So we do know that people that climb at high altitude and work out at high altitude actually are much, much more physiologically better athletes when we get them back down to sea level. And that's why these world athletes train at high altitude. But, but yeah, or they take drugs. But, but, so we'll talk about the natural way to increase your blood concentration. But clearly, if you're putting, pushing, putting through your veins or arteries, you do recognize that things are going to get stuck. And when things get stuck and you're dehydrated, we know that the risks of, is, uh, of embolic disease in the, in the, in the CV, uh, cerebrovascular system can be, can be secondary to level, high levels of dehydration. So we do know that outside of the mechanism of that, as, as we heard from our previous speaker, that what happens is the lack of oxygen actually ends up affecting the blood-brain barrier because it, it has no product to work with. Okay, so less oxygen means that things don't work so well. 
So what happens when you begin to climb? So we do know at around um, 3,000 meters, which is around 9,900 feet, so around 10,000 feet or so, people get shortness of, exertional shortness of breath. Now, some people get ex shortness of breath walking up the stairs, but clearly when you're at 10,000 feet, you get, you get a physiological shortness of breath. You can have some psychomotor impairment, so complex task begins to drop just marginally. Your reaction time slows down. You have altered uh, sleeping patterns and frequent waking at night and altered night vision. And this is when you're suddenly there. So if you go from sea level to 10,000 feet, we'd recognize that the higher you go and the faster you go, the more problems you have in terms of your, your development of altitude sickness. When we get to about 5,000 meters, which is around 15,000 feet, people have changes in learning and spatial memory. Some people get quite, quite dizzy and uh, can uh, have a paresthesia or a tingling in the feet and hands. And if you've ever been to the North River, the Grand Canyon, which sits at around 10,000 feet, a lot of people have this sort of low-grade headache um, that they just can't explain. And then as soon as you leave the North Rim and drive da back down into the base of the canyon, the headache kind of goes away. Okay? At 7,000 feet, uh, 7,000 meters, probably, pardon me, which is around 22,000 feet or so, people can hallucinate. Uh, there can for sure be MRI changes, and there was this phenomenal documentary that spoke about witnessed and, and filmed patient people walking up Everest. You can have impaired memory retrieval and changes in or loss of consciousness. And we do, when we were watching this documentary a little while ago, it actually showed people at this level putting their ski boots on the wrong way. So if you imagine at that level trying to climb up to the summit and you're actually putting your boots on the wrong feet or put, trying to put them on the wrong way, uh, that doesn't really sound too conducive for being successful in your journey. So um, we do know that your ability to be impaired actually goes the higher you go, and but more often the more faster you go. Okay. So what causes altitude sickness? Ascending um, faster than 300 meters per day, which is actually about 1,000 feet, which doesn't sound like an awful lot, and vigorous exercise. Um, and physically fit individuals and athletes also get altitude sickness, which you can see across a group of any number of people that decide to climb, and you have no idea if you're going to be one of those people or not. And I think that's the challenge that some athletes have. It's almost like febrile fever in children. The faster it goes, the, high, the faster, the higher it goes, the chances the kids will have a fever, I mean a seizure, something very similar to that. And so patients develop, or people develop acute mountain sickness. And it's the body's response to low oxygen pressure or the thinner air at higher altitudes. So people who ski, for example, in Wyoming or in different parts of the Appalachians, um, you can get symptoms even at ski resorts when you're up at the top and you decided you're going to go down that black diamond. Symptoms vary and are related to the rate of the ascent. Again, uh, depending on how fast you go, the faster you go, the more difficulty you have. And again, at around 10,000 feet, some people actually begin to ex experience a bit of a mild hangover type feeling, that they've got this vague headache, feels like they've got a helmet on their head that's a bit tighter than, than what it should be. And it's very common for people to get nauseated. This lady that I climbed with started to vomit at around 10,000 feet, and she just wouldn't stop, and we finally took her off the mountain because she just would not stop vomiting. Um, so people... This headache and fatigue actually worsens the higher you go and the faster you go. And it can happen regardless of how fit you are or how experienced you are. And it can lead to two, two, two problems that we see, both cerebral edema and pulmonary edema, known as HAPE and HACE. So HAPE is the uh, pulmonary edema, and that's related to the exchange. And what happens is people end up de developing, as we've all seen patients with pulmonary edema, this fluid development in the lung, and they start to cough up this bright, froth, frothy red stuff. Okay? And we know that it's never normal to be breathless as rest, even at, at the, they say, at the summit of Everest. Okay? And some climbers actually go without oxygen, actually, to Everest at the top at this point. Then there is haste, which is the cerebral edema, which both are life-threatening. Uh, but we all hear about patients that develop a metabolic encephalopathy associated with time-dependent exposure to hypoxia. And what happens is, as the blood-brain barrier doesn't get any oxygen, if you think about putting my hand around my throat and trying to cut off my oxygen, eventually my mouth will open. And the blood-brain barrier opens and stuff floods into the cell that shouldn't be there and the mitochondria don't work. And as these neurons swell from all of this fluid, they eventually don't work. And it is a form of azogenic edema. 
Neuro neurological manifestations include a persistent severe headache, uh, and the headache does not go away. It actually increases confusion and clumsiness. The patient, people lose the ability to do fine tasks like do up their boot, boots or buttons. They become ataxic. Fatigue is another problem that, uh, and also the higher you go, the slower you get because you cannot supply oxygen, enough oxygen to keep the muscles going. So people not only get kind of thick in the head, but they actually get slower as well. Visual disturbances and photophobia, uh, you can seize when you get to high levels, and they develop cranial three and cranial six palsies. So th what that means is your eyeballs actually don't move. Um, they get extreme emotion and loss of consciousness. And we heard, have heard of people who die of cerebral edema because they can't get down fast enough from the mountain. Um, and because, again, as we talked earlier, this is a closed box, and as things begin to swell, if you think about a bread box and you're trying to stuff everything into it, eventually the bread box is not going to be able to hold anymore. So different from a bed box, which the lid opens, we can't open the lid of anybody, so the brain just continues to swell and patients do herniate. So we do know that descent is the most successful treatment of getting patients down, uh, getting people down quicker than uh, how they did going up. So how do you prevent uh, altitude sickness? It's really, uh, it occurs by going too high too quickly. You need to acclimatize, so what they suggest is you climb to a certain height and, you, and then you stay there, and then you climb down and you rest, and you climb, then you stay there, then you come down and you rest. So sleep at a lower altitude than what you are climbing during the day, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, because you're climbing and climbing and climbing, you're exhausted, and they're saying, okay, now we're done, but we're gonna go back down there. And you're saying, I'm not going back down there. I've been down there. I'm not coming back up tomorrow. So, but the goal really is that you have to, you have to come back down and rest and acclimatize. You have to drink plenty of water. And as you know, alcohol is a dehyd de dehydrates you. And diamox or acetazolamide is actually the best drug for altitude sickness. Some people, they think decadron maybe just as well. But vasogenic edema is treated very well with diamox. There's some literature out there about the possibility of a high-carb diet or, or uh, ginkgo, but those have been inconclusive. So I wouldn't suggest giving someone ginkgo if they're having altitude sickness. It just, is, just feels a little intuitively uncomfortable. So this is a picture of a 33-year-old gentleman uh, who was um, evacuated off, off Mount Denali. And though, uh, this is Vicky's picture, and, and though you can't, uh, where's my, I wonder if the mouse will work. Oh, here we go. Can you, is that working? Yeah. So here's the ventricles, and what we're seeing is uh, what we're seeing is we're getting we're getting pushed of CSF out around the ventricles. So the patient ends up having, and this is what cerebral edema would look like at high altitude. So what happens is the pressure within the ventricles forces the CSF out and around the ventricles. So the patient had, had some leak in high altitude from the capillaries, and uh, some swollen cells. So how do they treat haste and hape? Uh, you have to take the patient down very rapidly, or as fast as you can get that patient off the mountain. Uh, the only drug to treat, treat it is uh, acetamol, acetazolamide, and it causes some minor side effects. Though I think patients, when they're in cerebral edema, don't really care too much about the side effects. But they include paresthesia in the, in the uh, fingers uh, and a funny metallic kind of weird taste. But, you know, if you're not quite there and you're confused, I'm not sure if you're going to be complaining about the taste. Uh, dexamethasone, um, it can and can be effective depending upon, um, depending upon the use. And again, it's actually low dose dex. Um, can be used prophylactically when climbing if you're going to climb. But again, dex, as you know, has some side effects. It's not a benign drug. And they, use, they, they put patients in these pressurized oxygen bags, almost like a hyperbaric chamber. Uh, and this bag is showing an evacuation of a person. And that tube that's attached is pressurizing. Um, the patient, and it actually buys time. So given that talk, that wee introduction to um, altitude sickness, I'm now going to introduce Abby. And Abby will come up and uh, speak with us about her experience in uh, altitude sickness in um, Mount Everest. <laughs> 